Enjoy the show. Play on the tanger. There hey, we are. How are you, man? How are you, man? Ah, oh, not bad, not bad. Nice to meet you guys. Very nice, nice to meet you. Man. It's a pleasure to have you on the Tales of the Hunted. Um, doing a little. I, I try to do a little bit of research into my guests when I have them on here. And um, were you the person from ICC that did the uh, article on Aleem? Yes. Yeah, that was me. I just left uh, ICC, like, technically today, I guess. And uh, I'm now head writer for Comics Illustrated, the project that Mike and Mindy Wheeler are. Yes, um, that was the first I, thing I, that I, I saw I on here. For submissions. Mm. Because Frank is obviously a, uh, he did Punisher War Journals, as well as Sleepwalker and a bunch of work for DC and Image and all the gambit out there. And he has his own comic, Karibi the Hunted, that I'm going to be doing the Kickstarter video for. We're having that come out um, in a good bit. Just got to get that all set up. So I did the side story for his comic. So we're really trying to get this thing moving. And I love the fact that you did do an article on Aleem because it's he is so talented his art style his story he just I saw his Facebook post today how he was like I gotta go for an actual kids book yeah. <laughs> sweet pea is dark and it is but that's why I love it he, do you find it, it uh, like almost like a talent finding like gems like Aleem out there to highlight well, uh, actually, a lot of it came from originally, it was through my, uh, what would you call it? It, it? it was just through like the way that I market myself mm -hmm. and the networking I've done over the past couple of years. So like when I started, when I started promoting my own book, uh, Badger, not Mike Barron's Badger, but he's cool oh, with it. That's I'm a whole okay. different story. Um, so I, what? <laughs> you got Frank's ears perked up. My Badger. Yeah, you're not the first person. And you know what? I probably owe a little bit of credit to how well I've done due to exactly that. But Okay. I, that's good marketing, okay? That's it's like perjangers. There's, it's not a word. You type in perjangers, hello. It's yeah. smart marketing like that. That does make sense. So when I, uh, when I started putting out my book, uh, I was just slapping it everywhere I could possibly get to. So I found myself in like 78 different indie comic promotion, like Facebook groups and stuff. And I was talking to anybody who would listen and just kind of networking my way up. And, oh, that was cool. High five. So I've sifted through, I don't know, tons and tons and tons of projects over the past couple of years. And uh, I'm also a moderator on the Indie Comics Source uh, Facebook group as well. So oh, really? it's just... I. I don't know. I, there might I, there might like be some sort of a compulsive issue with my personality. <laughs> just flying. <laughs> run with it, man. Just run with it. All I take. I get it, but if you if you want to do something like you were doing, because I scrolled down to your post from what was it like February eighteenth. And it was a very long, very long post, but I've read through the whole thing because you seem to have a lot of the same ideals that we have here on Projangers of Wallhangers Media Network. We're having Michael Florio join on with his podcast network under our uh, under our company because we want to help build people up. And especially with what you're doing with, um, da, 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 I have it pulled up, Hardway Publishing. Of how you say how you've had people thank you for believing in them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of it's course, easy. it's easy to see passion. I find with myself, it's but finding those people that are really truly passionate about their idea and want it desperately to get made, you can really pick that up. Especially with how many indie creators in general we've had here on Tales of the Hunted, it's really inspiring to me that there's another guy in a different kind of format in a different part of the world in Canada. You guys don't really have free speech. <laughs> um, we, it's we, okay. Uh, Big brother's listening. You, you, you it's, 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 like it's the, the, the biggest problem that I have, especially when it comes to small press. And one of the reasons why you'd see that there's not a lot of uh, Canadian small press is uh, well, 
manufacturing cost is a huge problem. Uh, I know that it, there are issues like Facebook and all that other. I, I, I don't know. I don't know that well because I haven't been outside of it to see it. But I can tell you firsthand that having that additional 15% handling a service tax every time material moves from one guy to another guy adds up really fast. And yeah. it murders our bottom line up here. I can imagine. Wow. I mean, hearing Frank and Aleem and all of the content creators that I've had on here talk about the cost of a table at a Comic-Con, the cost of getting their idea printed and actually getting colorist and covers and all that. Carissa Grant, the Girl Scout of indie comics with uh, Holy Chaos Redemption. My God, the woman has like the next three years planned out, mapped out, covers for two years. It's it's There's it's that kind of dedication and passion in the indie field that I find you won't find anywhere else. Oh, absolutely. Like there's even like I started to mention there before, you, yeah. up here because of the, the prohibitive costs and it, particularly because of the uh, the problems that you have with mailing stuff out. Like in Canada, the population spread out so wide that our shipping costs are astronomical, even just to get something from one city to another. So you really got to hedge your bet and like calculate your risk months ahead before okay. you go do a print or pretty much anything up here. It's, uh, it's, it's logistically challenging. <laughs> it sounds like it. I mean, I mean, wow. it, even not, I didn't even really think of that little logistical problem of shipping. It oh yeah. yeah. So expensive. A beast, an absolute beast. Like if I want to, if I want to send something from where I'm at right now in Fredericton, New Brunswick up to like, say uh, Bathurst, which is just on the, like diagonally is pretty much across the province. It's going to cost me three times what it would for me to mail the same envelope to Texas. No <laughs> shit. Wow. And that's including the charge that I have to pay just to get across the border. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's weird up here. It's because they don't have as much stuff on the trains. That's the biggest reason. And you know, taxes. Well, yeah. I mean, it's also, I mean, you guys are, <laughs> You guys are way far north than us, and I got to imagine weather is also attributed in with that shipping because you'll have delays because of that crazy shit goes on. Yeah, anybody who's uh, really you know romantically excited about the thought of snow uh, hasn't spent enough time in it. In my opinion. <laughs> the farther north you go, the 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 more you hear of how your snow isn't shit. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine that that does make sense. Like we're in Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia, and I had a I used to work with a guy at a car dealership uh, mechanic, and he was from Upper New York, and he was like, "Dude, five five feet of snow, we'd still be going to school. Everything's perfectly plowed. Everything's that, and it's like you know three inches of a possibility, and they're canceling schools now because they're just going to tack it on the back end." People jumping off buildings, and I don't, I can't take it. Yeah, you know, yeah. Your, your flex contest as to how cold it usually is in your city. Like that's, that's the day one. Like, oh, only twenty. Oh, that's nothing. <laughs> that's, it's weird. <laughs> well, you won't catch me there. I'll tell you that. It's a weird yeah. kind of peacock in there. Like twenty-five, <laughs> please. Yeah, pretty. <laughs> like what? You not? You didn't have thermals on that day? No. <laughs> But wow. I mean, the difference, uh, the difference is only a little bit there because just through I wanted to explore a little bit more in here on hard way publishing and your overall goal that you want for that business, because it seems like it comes from a good place. I, I, I want to expand. Uh, like I mentioned before, there isn't a, like I mentioned during that, what would you call it, rant? Yeah, uh, there there isn't really a it lot of a, opportunity. It was a rant. <laughs> if we're putting a definition to it, it was a rant. Yeah. But it was a very well worded rant. Thank you. Um, I there isn't a lot of opportunity for people to do stuff like this up here in Canada. Like we have we have a couple of the small like uh, television broadcasting companies like uh, CBC. I don't even know if CTV Atlantic still exists. Anymore. Honestly, but like, a couple of uh, small ones, but they they get 
they they play very safe. I find mm-hmm. um, comes to media and that they're trying to catch the majority because they are nationally broadcasted. And uh, as far like I mentioned, small press is just too cost prohibitive, too risky mm-hmm. for most people. Uh, there were a couple of animation studios down here, and I know like the Trailer Park Boys yes. was filmed in Nova Scotia. But when the, I don't want to screw this up. I think it was Stephen McNeil was the premier of Nova Scotia about four or five years ago. They actually had to cut the Nova Scotia film tax credit. And the Trailer Park Boys even moved over to Europe to shoot. So there was like, Damn. like art in Eastern Canada was really drying up. I don't know if it still is because I've been busy staring at my comic pages and just letting the mm. world burn around. <laughs> Tis the way of life go. these days. I'm just keep my head down, hope for the best. Um, yeah, but I want I want to get into a position where I have a decent distribution chain and uh, a network set up where I can ideally help other people get into this and mm-hmm. preferably even be able to just straight up pay folks. Like I've hired a couple of people to do like covers and different stuff like that for me. I've got a Kickstarter coming up for reprinting of Badger. It's going to be running in March and I've got alternative covers. I'm going to reprint like single issue floppies of all four books. That's also going to be the release of the fourth book. And, uh, but it's, it's really, I, I'm not spreading money around as much as I want to. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just a, it's a it's a scant resource these days for a lot of people. So any good bit that you can give, like uh, when we had Carissa Grant on, she mentioned how her artist went full time after a while with her. So she felt the need to like, okay, I gotta feed this guy, I gotta pump this out, and Man, she also she was also doing like week long kickstarters, but she's pulling major numbers. So when you do marketing correctly in the indie world you really can it, it will bring your effort back to it especially when you have people like you looking at different artists like you know what why don't you help me why don't you do that because that's a lot of the pay it forward kind of system that i find a lot of the indie world has you know yeah, some or rising tide races all ships it's a oh. good mentality to have a nice one yeah yeah so, there's i uh, really a lot of sense in being super competitive in mm-hmm. this because i mean like the people who are drawn to comic books uh first and foremost i've noticed that just from my research that the majority of that demographic they're pretty much the same people who like who want the physical book are the same people who brought back the vinyl record they're mostly dudes between like 30 and 45 years old they had right? it in their and past they want to relive I- those memories and those songs which is big yeah, yeah, it's a chunk of trying to buy your childhood back, right? But it's also people that are like disillusioned with the majority of what's accessible in media right now. Like Netflix, they're just pumping stuff out, but they can't keep up with the demand because it is so accessible. Yes. Well, we're not going to now to guys with or guys and girls with a uh, Bristol card and pencils like anytime soon. That's just it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> It kind of it, it popped open Pandora's box in a way. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. So everybody's kind of scrambling to see what the best way moving forward is. Now, I mean, fans all over, I think, have just been kind of well accepting that there's two ways to go about the streaming platform right now. You either completely ignore it or you watch it your way. Binge week by week. It's pretty much, you know, a free for all right now. People like Amazon apparently don't believe in putting out good content or frequent content. There's this kind, but you have Netflix dumping out content all the time. Yeah. Hey, what do you want to watch? They'll buy the licensing and put it on there for you just so you don't go to anywhere else. Yeah. (laughs) So it's that kind of immediacy. Now, Frank usually asks this question, but. With comic artists, we always do want to know what are some of your inspirations that drove you and your art forward. All right, as far as uh, as far as artistic inspiration goes, mm-hmm. uh, you've seen my stuff. It's obviously very cartoony. Uh, 
I actually taught myself how to animate before I got into the sequential thing. Oh. So like, I just, yeah, I've, I've, like I said, I need to go see a therapist or something. I'm just too ambitious with a lot Especially of if you went to animation, which is so much more masochistic. Yeah, that's just... <laughs> that's what I jumped in. So I was looking at, like, the stuff by Richard Williams, the stuff by Preston Blair, Tex Avery, like, all that. And then figuring out the timing and simplifying stuff. And there's obviously some influence from stuff that, like, I grew up with. Uh, the Bob Camp. Um, say uh, Mike Judge. I I I mm. feel when I look at my stuff, I see a lot of Mike Judge influence. Like I don't, it, especially the nose. I can't stop drawing like that for some reason. There was a style that he brought to it, and you know he was like Matt Groening, were one of those people in animation that kind of changed it forever. And yeah, it was so grungy compared to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. For the 90s. It fit the 90s because you had yeah. that grunge scene and now you had that grungy animation. Yeah. He had an ACDC t-shirt on. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it still felt like, especially with the waviness of it, it, it was original. You know, you didn't really see anything else, and you still don't see anything else out there animation-wise like those original Beavis and Butthead. You're even the movie. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Beavis and Butthead do America. Yeah. You going to Vegas, huh? There's lots of slots in Vegas. Fantastic. <laughs> 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 yeah. Like there is so there's so much there's that's a really good pull, especially if that's a big one for your art because it makes it very original. Um we had Thank on you. Stephen Russell of Tales of Nihilism, and he had that kind of more of a uh, nihilism was his goal. So he went for more of a darker use of heavy black and whites in his artwork. And even just from looking at your 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 cover artwork on your Facebook, I, I get that kind of cartoony kind of feel from that. It get, it kind of really makes sense how, especially with animation. Now, are you any way uh, like an anime fan or manga or anything like that? Uh, yeah, d definitely. Like, you know, the kind of like the big ones. I guess that's the, the safest way to say it. I got like, you know, I was into Berserk and like One Piece and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Not like hyper, hyper obscure, crazy mm -hmm. into it. Right. I mean, I. I, I Read a little bit of Chainsaw Man, but I couldn't get into it. You know what? That's you know a what? very weird one. That I'm not gonna lie. Even for me, I'm an anime fan. Like I was just watching Crunchyroll, it's like on lunch today. <laughs> I, I I I love it. But Chainsaw Man, even I'm like, okay, guys, where are we going here? Because this is this is a little bit much. But you know, when you talk about the big ones, one of one of the ones that I often when I'm out at the cons and everything. Kids love and adults love all the same. One Punch Man. Yeah, yeah One Punch Man. Yeah, that's it's. I haven't I haven't seen all of it, but I've seen enough of it. To... If you've seen the first season, you know the best anime intro music ever. Like, it's the, the end. End the outro music sucks, but the intro music for One Punch Man is fucking legendary. I have it as my business partner Chris his uh, ringtone because. His son and I, he's my little one punch buddy. He actually bought me like a fleece one punch man Saitama a blanket one Christmas. Amazing. You know, so you have that kind of a love that brings people together over an animated or anime character, especially these days. You have kids like uh, I forget who was telling us that they saw at the one Comic Con people running up to. Um, What's his name? James Swanson, who's uh, all for one that we saw at uh, Blue Hen. Oh, see, yes. You see people from all over running up to him. That was their plan, just so they could see this guy who voiced right. the character. Fuck the artist. <laughs> that guy, you're all for one. And even I'm, I'm standing there like, oh, man, you know, I love your work. You're, you're great. You can't help it. But an appreciation for the artistic side is also, you know, B 
big in these days, and especially linked to, mostly in part to, I would say, the Comic Con community. Have you done Comic Cons? Um, do they allow those in Canada? Uh, we have we have a couple of. I'm sorry, like, I'll stop taking shots. <laughs> ah, uh, uh, we, we do have like yeah. fan conventions and different things like that. We don't have like the big Comic Con. I think they might do one in Toronto. I'm not entirely sure. No, I'm almost certain they do do one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Niagara <laughs> Falls, that one. Uh, Buffalo, Niagara Falls. Uh, one's in Canada, and the other one's on the other side of the border. Okay. Uh, so, well, the other yeah, big yeah. one, Fan yeah. Expo, but smaller. Uh, I, smaller is probably not the right word, but yeah, uh, like say mid-size conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, they're probably small by your guys' standards in the U.S. and those larger cities, but they've been springing up more and more just since COVID kind of like chilled yeah. out, which is saying really awesome things, I think, as far as the market's concerned. Well, Frank and I, I was was involved. Frank is involved in a local Comic Con around us, the Great Media Comic Con, and it's very much a small Comic Con, but they're getting a lot of people and the community, especially everybody. When we've gone around in uh, local cons around the area and talked about this con, people get excited because when there's a good family friendly local event near you, especially with a bunch of independent creators that just want you to know about their project it's a fun time but it's also a way for you to clean house and get your name out there get your product out there and get more people and especially like we were telling I, we do we do so many podcasts now but it's a good bit of advice i think for anybody who is in an artistic market to go to those smaller cons mid-size cons if you can if the price is right don't go shelling out like five hundred a table if you're not Mark McKenna. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like at the smaller conventions, you're more likely to pull people. Like if if you go to say a, a larger one and you're an unknown and then you got, and you, this is just something I've read. This isn't something I've experienced myself. But if you're gonna go to like San Diego or somewhere down in LA, one of those huge conventions, most of the people who came in through that door wanted to go in there and get one dude's signature and then leave. Like yep. they're not, they're not looking at every table, but if you go to these smaller conventions, if you go to these like zine fairs, if you go to like, like I'm talking at, uh, I do craft markets. Okay. I do straight craft markets. I mean, my, my fiance, she actually runs a business from home where she does like cosplay and hair accessories and stuff on a 3d printer. So I've kind of yeah. already gotten and we just share a table. That's but an still. awesome end. I mean, especially, that's a fucking awesome business, cosplay. And with a 3D printer, there's a lot of stuff you can do. But hair uh, extensions, yeah. I'd never even thought of that. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Wow. She makes cool stuff. Nice. So we, we, we share tables at, at events. We kind of try to market it that way regardless. So, you know, if, like, I've got a convention of Miramichi that's coming up in May. And I've got the table book that's going to be myself representing Hardway Publishing publishing and also evil cat creations and it's like i marketed it as cosplay accessories it's like hair accessories and jewelry she just does her own thing we just find ways to spin it so we can get each other in to these it's, events it's the smart way of doing it and you're not the first person we've had on the do that do it like that most infamously the episode we just did or i'm just about to release now is with jerks productions it's him and his wife she sells food he links you, and then while you're eating, hey, here's this movie I made. Oh, all right, I'm already eating. I got I got to watch something. That kind of interesting dichotomy that couples form of, well, you're going to be there anyway. Well, I can sell this. And now that makes sense because it's one table, two products. The fans are more likely to go because it's the con is going to love you because it's bang for their buck. You're getting two for one. Yeah, and we... More often than not, you only got to pay the one table fee. You're mm -hmm. pulling in, uh, you're pulling in audience and supporters from both, from my project as well as hers. So it's yeah, it's everybody wins. It's a smart, a smart way of going about it. I mean, I've been podcasting for a long time with perch hangers and wall hangers. We're five going on six years, and we've always stood on the platform of building other each other up, giving one another this soapbox for them to put their idea out there in a long format 
because it's you get a complete sense of who that person is in the longer conversation. Not only we hear about your publishing company as well as your comic, your work in journalism, which is not easy, just overall. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I can write an article. Well, can you write a good article? <laughs> All right, I'll take that one. I thought you meant the interviews. I was like, the, inter the interviews are awesome because I'm just like messaging people who I'm already a fan of. Mm -hmm. And I'm being like, hey, can I pick your brain, help you sell your own thing? And also you're doing a good chunk of my job for me. And then I just like go on with my day. And at the end of it, it's like I, the editing sucks. But other than that. <laughs> Dude, first off. I'm a fan of the efficiency. All right, I was a I was a fucking dealership mechanic. You have to love efficiency if that is your lifeblood. It it hasn't left. It's like a weird fucking kink. I love efficiency. That is the most efficient way of doing it. You know, and in the indie market, you have to think efficiently if oh, you absolutely. really want your project to go. Right. Yeah. Like Frank, yeah. you're telling Caribe, black and white. Just cost effective, uh, efficient, uh, uh, and there's a big market for black and white comics. Well, I don't know, but um, but nowadays I, I just I'd remember, say more often than not, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the Batman black and white, which was a uh, I mean, I love that black, white, and reds are big. Uh, the, the red one that they come out, yeah, but um, the uh, average sort of Conan, the uh, Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, and uh, those. Horror black and whites used to come out years ago. I mean, I, I'm still stuck in that, you know. I mean, I just yeah, that's those were some of the you know really masters of it. So that's why I like. So, as far as what you've done now artistically compared to what would you like to do in the future? Would you like to see? one of your projects go to live action or animation? Do you have an animation project that you'd like to do? I, all right. I've got tentative plans, tentative. That, so Badger is originally set up that the first story arc is going to be completed in the sixth issue, one way or another. Uh, I am good friends with Mike Sears, the guy that does that. He did Rabbit Man, and now he's doing Mouse Man so for lesser known. Problems. I saw that when I was looking into you. The um, it was a really the apathetic Mouse Man. Yes, that's it. I love that so, name. It's such a good title. The apathetic so, Mouse Man. Like, oh shit, an apathetic <laughs> mouse. You're not gonna chew through my wall and chew through that brand new messenger bag I bought a week before. So I don't have to stuff steel wool, wool, steel wool in the wall and kill you? Ah, oh, that, that apathetic mouse sounds so much nicer than the other mice that I've seen. <laughs> yeah, this one's a little messed up. <laughs> what might uh, hurt? So uh, Mike, Mike's a good friend of mine, and we've been going back and forth, spitballing all these projects we want to work on stuff for a couple of years, and it's... I'd be very, very, very surprised if Mike Sears and I don't end up collaborating on a video game sometime in the next couple of years, I hope. I don't know. He's done that before. I haven't so much, but we we both have experience with animation, so what I'm not kind, entirely sure. What, what kind of a game would you be thinking of? Platformer or more fighting adventure? I'm thinking platformer, but... He, he seems to be more comfortable doing like the RPG type thing. So I'm not entirely sure. I don't even know exactly what it would look like yet. Mixing the two is also something that is really popular that I've seen on Steam. One of the first bits of content creation I did was I would go through Steam. I'd find a game for under $5 that was awesome. Or I'd do some other kind of game content. And that's when... Steam became a big thing. That's when the advent of platformers came back. And yeah. a lot of people, they even did 3D platformers. Like, I believe the game is uh, Tenaria. Uh, Tenaria? I should remember the game. They gave it to me for free. Um, but there's, there's ways to go about both. Even mixing the two of a platformer RPG, any kind of a good game that you two could create I think would be a good way to move both brands going forward, especially because video game market, that's not going to go anywhere. 
Yeah. Well, I remember his old, like, I think he rebranded his uh, self-publishing imprint when he got the deal with LKC. Because now it's like Cartoon Cafe or something like that. But he used to call it uh, Janky Cartoons. <laughs> and then the when we were, you know, bantering, spitballing back and forth, he's like, come on, man, hard and janky games. Like, like you wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, "All right, the name's got me half sold already." Yeah. <laughs> so, a good so, name will do that, you know. Yeah, that's what that's what marketing is. Yes. Yeah, there's a there's level a- of marketing that you have to put into everything, but you're doing it well, especially you know, with switching over, well, back rather to Comics Illustrated. What sets this apart from other ventures that you've done? Uh, well, Mike and Mindy Wheeler are very good, I find, at getting people's attention. If, if nothing else will be said about them, they're fantastic at getting people's attention. I'm looking at the uh, Rogue uh, you know, swimsuit post here, which... Uh, oh, Mark, that's Joe Jesco, yeah. Nice. Very, like... It's very good artwork, first off, but I mean, just, you know, Comics Illustrated, Swim, Swimsuit Illustrated isn't a thing anymore, but Comics Illustrated, there's something, it feels very familiar to you while, okay, I like comics. Yeah. But uh, over and above that, I find, like, I, I'd done a couple things for Mike and Mindy through Comics Illustrated before the, the writing gig came up, uh, and they were just, like, uh, illustrated submissions for their quarterly specials and that was like pro pro bono promotional type stuff but just the the way they communicated the way that they made clear what they needed and what they wanted and when they wanted by and the way they dealt with things that weren't heading in the direction it needed to go and just i i everything they were just so professional they're so professional to work with like on the back end of it that i was like if i get the opportunity to like immediately i will immediately get back over here and then when i got the deal with uh when i started working with icc magazine uh, it ended up being like a conflict of interest thing mm. and, they told me that I wouldn't be able to continue working with Comics Illustrated so long as I was doing the stuff with ICC. So I put up a few articles with ICC, and then shortly after that, Mike contacted me and asked me if we could come to some sort of a paid agreement where I would come back to Comics Illustrated. So I it wasn't hard to convince me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, though, especially with coming back to you, you know? I mean, it's... When you see some, when you meet somebody and you realize, like, oh, we're kind of on the same frequency, it's a magic yeah. thing, especially professionally. You know, very seldomly in my professional life, but when you do get that kind of, oh, all right, we're on the same page, it makes it easier to communicate with the other person, even if things aren't going in the right direction. You know, yeah. and it's, it's a, a better feeling. If it's more a home, homey feeling, I find. Yeah, it, it, that's exactly what it is. And I, especially like creatives and particularly creatives in the, the indie circuit. I know a lot of us are, well, we're, we're a lot of one man shows. We're a lot of smaller, uh, mm-hmm. we're noobs. A lot of us are noobs, right? <laughs> like the, majority, the majority of us are noobs. Um, so it, it becomes very difficult to discuss that kind of stuff, right? Like a lot of people don't have backgrounds in business. A lot of people don't have experience working inside the industry. I I didn't. I still don't have a lot of experience working inside the industry. But I found a lot of people trying to collaborate with out in the wild. Uh, it's tricky. You you end up risking a lot of your time and throwing a lot of your time into projects that just get dusty. And it's it's hard to get people on the same page to focus on one thing and just get it out. Like, has, has anybody tried to schedule a game at Dungeons & Dragons? We did. Because that's what you think. <laughs> First off, it's hard. But yeah. <laughs> we actually had one uh, one planned <laughs> taping that didn't go through. So I get that. But, you know, I'm also, I have, I have to edit what we did. But, 
Yeah, I get that. I get that. We yeah. just started a, a new podcast on the network called Hit Points and Half Measures. And it's with no. Frank, myself, and uh, Aleem, legit, as well as uh, Michael Florio of Wild Oni. And uh, Joe Clay is our DM, our dungeon master. It's all amazingly fun. And it's a super great, super great podcast that'll come out on the network soon. But I totally get what you mean there because scheduling a podcast. Now, Discord, and I went to Discord and recording because it makes it super easy. Hey, when are you free? You free? I'm free. We're good. Now, coming over to the studio like we used to do on this network, that was like trying to schedule a circus. I bet. It's so difficult to try to coordinate, you know, three other people's lives. My brother's right there. It's easy. I do a pod. I've been doing a podcast with him for over, you know, three years called Lug Nuts. So there's that kind of sometimes it's easy. A lot of times it's difficult to just schedule that thing out and get all the logistics. Just my nerves get so shot sometimes from on podcast day, you know, and I'm just I've, like, it's going to happen. What the hell is going on? In my late teens and early 20s, I was actually a musician. I was in a punk band, of all things. Nice. And absolutely. I was absolutely. in a punk band in, in middle school. In- <laughs> middle school. Oh, I used to have a bass guitar. My friend had the uh, uh, had the electric guitar. He'd come over. Our other friend had drums. We were going to be a band. Never did anything with it. But we had fun jamming together. And music is has is one of those things, I think, in a child's first you know, formative years, it's really great to pick up and learn music because it helps you creatively later on down the line. Absolutely. When you write, one because I always like to find out uh, different things about people's writing process because oftentimes we do certain things ritualistically that to connect with the muse. But I found one thing that helps me is listening to music. Specifically with me, it's rap music. I've said on this podcast infamously many times, but when I wrote the backstory for Frank's comic, I started off like, where do I want to go? I got to start off right. I went with Protect Your Neck by Wu-Tang Clan. And I let the YouTube algorithm go. But hey, you know. And the fingers kept on typing. So I found that lyrically uh, apt, you know, well, music that has a lot of lyrics into it to where there's a lot of thought. You have to look at the words, you know, that kind of thing help jostle things loose, especially like maybe you get kind of stuck on something like, how does this work out? Okay, go back, reread it, done. Now move on. You know, I find it easy for me to, to listen to music. I've also heard some creatives like, oh, you listen to music? Oh, no, I couldn't do that. So what is along that, that kind of lines? How is your writing process compared to mine? Uh, the writing aspect of it, the majority of it, I, I, I generally script everything out kind of like as if I'm doing a, like a screenplay and I'll do mostly focus on the dialogue. I, I usually, I, I just do it in my notepad on my phone a lot of the time. So I'll like do it when I'm at my day job, like in the bathroom or waiting for like the photocopy or something. Right. Um, That's fair. Yeah. Uh, sitting down and drawing everything at the drafting table, I'll usually put music on. Usually, uh. Something I don't have to focus too hard on. Uh, I, I go for Random Access Memories by Daft Punk, okay. that album. And um, Elvis Costello's My Name is True. That's not one of my go-tos. But I, I, don't, I don't know why. But I just find it really easy to just have it in the background. And yes. Everybody shut up doing something. Right? Sometimes familiar white noise. Yeah. That, okay. Oh, I love this part. And... That familiar white noise in the background, it's almost, it's, a, it's like uh, when snow falls. It's the most quiet. You know, you can be the most focused. I should try doing it with like, I don't know, dope or something. Playing. <laughs> <clears throat> that, that would bleed through my work like really well. I think. You know, I mean, That's there's different fun. different things that you can do to help jostle the, the creative uh, juices free as it were. So hell freezes over. Marvel and DC are both knocking down your door. Okay. Your 
own project. Hey, we want you to do a project in our universe. What are you doing? A title that's already owned by one of those. I would say in the MCU, they come to you like, "Hey, we want you to he uh, we want you to head this MCU project going forward in the future." Because the MCU is going animated, they're also because <laughs> they're they're seeing what the fans like, but also they're doing these uh, you know Marvel presents to where they're just having a spotlight on this one character. DC is going forward with their own separate plans, but they do have Elseworlds and separate projects like that with the animated universe. So would you want to be animated or do something live action would be the first part of the question. The second would be, who would you want more, DC or Marvel? I animated. get there eventually. Okay. Animated for the scheduling issues that we were already discussing. Mm-hmm. Or <laughs> fun. Um... And uh, if I had to pick between the two, I would definitely lean more towards DC companies, particularly like you know their their Vertigo imprint and like their Dark Horse and like that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they gave us Preacher, man. We did get Preacher. That was a show. Yeah. I mean AMC. You know, AMC well, actually did a lot for comics. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean. They tried with Walking Dead, but there was no way in the living hell you could put what Robert Kirkman put in that comic on the television. There is no way in fucking hell, especially with the Michonne and the governor part. That wouldn't happen in a moment. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe today. No, no. no I don't just think that. that just think that about it, the. The story I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but supposedly when Nickelodeon approached uh, Joan and Vasquez to what eventually became Invader Zim, I heard that they wanted uh, Squee, which was his spinoff title from Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. And he was like, no, I'm not putting that on television. <laughs> I'll give you something else. Dude. I'm not putting this in front of children. Oh, man, that's... That, that you know what? That's probably in hindsight. That was probably the best choice to make at the time. Um, yeah, that, that's what I heard. I don't know if it's true. Or not. It's easy to give in to impulses uh, at the whim. So that that's the take of a of a, a, at least a, a astute mind to say, "You want me to do what?" Yeah, exactly. No, no I'm not doing that. Have you read this thing? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oh, but I mean, you get that spinoff thing if America likes what they do with the watered down version. But also, that's yeah. how I got into reading comics again. When I was in my late 20s, early 30s, I was into The Walking Dead. My friend said, look, if you like The Walking Dead show, read the comic. And then it cascaded from there. So right. Frank and I kind of stumbled on to Tales of the Hunted, but it kind it has become and I want it to continue to be a hub for indie content creators to have this soapbox to talk about their project because nobody else is going to. You used to have local news, local media, but like you're saying, the smaller markets, they're either bought out or they're shut down because it's yeah. there's too much of a cost to it. But guess what doesn't have a cost? Not that much of an overhead, a podcast. And this podcast platform like i mentioned previously in this podcast that we want to build each other up my soapbox is your soapbox and i think that it's a big thing that you kind of have the same mentality in your own business sense because you realize we're all just going to get better yeah absolutely that and i know like again growing up in eastern canada it was like this was such a hopeless idea for absolutely, like, nobody in their right mind would take this seriously. I still have a hard time with, it, with people around here, honestly, but which was what inspired that rant. <laughs> I get it, because... Uh, but I'm, I got the skills to show that people do want representation here for it. They're just like, yeah. no, you can't do that. I'm like, why? Well, because somebody else would have done it already. That's dumb. <laughs> That's a really good reason. <laughs> See, the thing that I've found, if I'm going to go off on my own rant, because with podcasting, the immediate question is, do you get paid for that? 
well, no, I'm, it's a passion project. I do it in my free time. And when I tell people how long I spend editing, like when I did, uh, I had Chris Pierre Domenico of Delco the movie. He's the director of that local indie film. I had him on. I spent easily about like four, four and a half hours editing that podcast alone on top of making it happen, producing the product, and then promoting the product on top of that. You tell people how much time you actually sink into this passion project that you don't get paid for. And they look at you like you're mental. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to joke I have two and a half full time jobs. <laughs> yeah. I tell people at work, yeah, punch off of one, punch on the other. Yeah. Because you go home and then there's the networking. I have to con- I have to answer people back that reach out to me because now people reach out to me to be on the podcast, which is a great problem to have, honestly. I mean I'll talk to you. And it's very much you have to love what you do, but Getting to a point to where you're at, to where, hey, Comics Illustrated, you know, they're not knocking on my door. They're not knocking on Frank's door. But they said, hey, we want you to come back. You know, I've had people professionally say that to me, and it makes you feel good. You're like, oh, man, I love work. Well, let's go. Well, let's do it. It's, it's Yeah. It's definitely, it's, it's a real nice ego fluff. I don't know how many of those I can handle. Oh, you just accept them when they come, because usually life is kicking you in the balls, like. As yeah. much as it can. Then I remember all the rejection letters. <laughs> I kind of leveled. Right. Yeah. It's one of those things yeah. that everybody has that kind of the struggle to their tail to where you look like the craziest person in the room. And everyone else is like, what? But a couple of people are like, hey, man, love what you did. Keep yeah, going. And your, your job as creator is to find every single one of those crazy bastards. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. In Delco, they're easy to peg out. <clears throat> Delaware yeah. County people are, you know, ah, you're one of those guys. I, I got you. Generally, if they look like they p- play D and D or Warhammer three thousand, I usually try to. Hey, man, what's going on? <laughs> Four thousand. See. Forty. Forty. Damn, they're up to forty now, huh? This guy's well, really going. <laughs> Uh, I'm all about the jokes on here, but I definitely want you to come back on uh, again, man. It's if you know anybody else content creator wise, you think they love being on, man. I'd love to talk to them because I love putting out there all the indie content because I've said before, people are getting tired of the serialized content they're getting from big movie and big businesses. And you're tired of what you're put, you're seeing in Star Wars. You're tired of what you're seeing in Marvel and DC. Now they're trying to shake it up. Guess who was already shaking it up? The indie content creators. They didn't have to put out Captain America. They could be inspired by Captain America. They could be inspired by the Hulk. And then they just said, let's mix you together with a little bit of like Spawn and Deadpool. And that's their character. And their world is something completely different. They have a completely different different set of rules so they don't have to adhere to all of the normal rules that the bigs do and that's where you find a lot of interesting content a lot of original content that will be the next i'd say the next craze because when you look at like you were talking about before the fatigue that the streamers are getting they're looking for content they're looking for books they're looking for comics they're looking for different indie things that they can exploit and make the next show that your maybe your comic will be maybe yours will be the next animated show they're like you know what we gave duncan trussell a show why not give you a try (laughs) midnight gospel is great by the way oh yeah yeah midnight gospel fucking amazing i need another season of that but that's what i find with the indie market and i want all our fans to hunt you metaphorically Metaphorically, guys, I always got to put that disclaimer out there. He's in Canada. Some people may be, you know, wear orange, not camo. A hiking place, man. (laughs) Orange camo would be great. You're still camo, but everybody knows that's not a deer. That's definitely that's definitely not deer. Maybe a sick moose, not a deer. But I hope to your continued success, man, and. 
goddamn, I hope everybody gets to check out everything you do. And I hope you get to continue to interview a lot of great independent content creators because I'm enjoying the hell out of it. And I just stumbled into it. Awesome. So, again, yep. Stop. check out Ryan and everything he does, especially his comic. Check him out at his local cons events that if you want to plug all the stuff uh, the uh, the events you're going to be at where they can find your comic and all that we definitely We're want our fans to know yeah i can send you links i mean i can't spread everything off off the top of my head but uh, yeah here's okay. a send me the links i'll add them in there but if anything stands out to you this is uh, definitely the time all right the big uh, big one this could be like my first comic convention like official comic convention is i'm going to be up at the I don't know where it is. It's in Miramichi. Uh, Mar- Maricon. It's uh, okay. Miramichi. Smaller. It's a smaller village up in uh, northern New Brunswick. Now, we use we use the word village a little liberally up here. So it's... I think it's got a... I don't even know what it has for population. I'm going to shut up. You know what? It doesn't matter the population. One of the, yeah. one of the, one of the best cons oh, I had... Uh, the best times I had at a con last year was at the Ocean City Comic Con. And Ocean City is one of those beach towns. It was during the winter is when they had the convention. And I can't tell you how many people from that community came up and they said, thank you for being here. We don't have a lot going on here. This is really big for our community. It means a lot to all of us that you guys came out, you showed up at the con. And that kind of that kind of just thanks, I find that you'll probably find that a lot at those smaller cons around you because just like that woman told me there's not a lot going on and to have an event to where the community can get together and see the creative content around them and then with you and your mission of building everybody up you're going to stand out and it's going to your hard work will show thank you i think i think you will find that you're really going to love those small cons i know because that's where I fell in love with cons. It was right at the Great Media Comic Con with Frank and all the amazing times that you have, all the amazing interactions. It's part of the, the it's part of the process that just sit back and enjoy it. You're already a good salesman, so you're just gonna have a blast. Awesome. So thanks for, thanks for hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. You know, sharing what you know and uh, you know just uh, what's going on in Canada. You know. Yeah. But, uh, you have anything that's really going on i mean feel free reach out and uh you know i'd love to have you back again absolutely uh, yes gang this has been the tales of the hunted podcast we always like to end off this podcast the same way we love you we miss you and we want to see you next time wall jangers until the next hunt game on boys and girls bye-bye Bye. <laughs> yeah that was good been a lot of fun, Ryan. Yeah, was, yeah absolutely. Right. I was awesome. I was hanging with the thread there for the last like five minutes to see my phone battery going down. I'm like, I hope it's an hour. <laughs> I'm at one percent. Uh, well, it worked out better than our podcast with Jabbar because he crapped out in the end. We were just left like, oh my god, did we piss him off? I don't know. Maybe he hated my joke. I don't know. <laughs> so I'll let you charge, man. Thank you so much. No, well, thank you guys, and I'll for sure. All right, man. Have a good one. Yeah, bye. That went well. Not that bad. went well. I mean, especially for like, hang on, Aleem. What did you throw me into? There's like no information on this guy. Oh, my God. Is this Facebook? That was cool, though. I've, I've read that rant, and I was like, oh, we're going to have fun. Especially because it wasn't until I, I read that rant, I knew he was in Canada. And I was like, Phew. Yeah. I've I've listened to Jordan Peterson. I know that's a wacky town. <laughs> well, it's a it wacky it was fucking it was town, it was, dude. Uh, there, coming to sale from Canada, you know, there's quite a bit, you know. Yeah, because they left. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for it to be that difficult to uh, uh, mail something, I mean, I can't believe it's that. But you know, I don't want to. There's just a lot of it's it's not just the mail. They make everything difficult over there. Like Jesus Christ. I mean, a lot of people, they everybody's happy, everybody's nice in Canada. When I went over in, you know, Niagara Falls, all that. Hey, Canada. Of course, everybody's nice. But 
I also know the story of the one stand-up comedian who got sued for something he said on stage. That don't sit right with me. Well, it's another country. It's not, you know, freedom of speech. You know, exactly. Everyone's like, oh, I'll move to Canada. I'm like, I'm never going there. I was born in the right country. Are you fucking kidding me? Do you know how privileged you are right now? I'm old up there. What are you talking about, man? Throughout a and Through, snow schools going on. Oh yeah, I had to mention that snow. But throughout a decade of podcasting up in Canada, I definitely would have been arrested, sued, yeah. something. <laughs> oh my god, P- prison probably, probably, probably. But yeah. imagine prison over there is like you know. Are you uh, having a nice uh, day? No. All over oh, here. Here's another pillow. Yeah. Thank, thank you. It's it's chilly. Nice. You might want to. You want me raise the temperature up for you? Could okay. you? Good, yeah, wow. just a couple degrees would be fine. Nothing crazy. Yep. They're they're like yeah. hospitable, but they're also modest. Like ah, I mean, just a degree would be good. Ah, I'll yeah. do two. I'll do two. Yeah. Wow. But well, it's crazy, hey. man. And especially that's why I wanted to highlight him as soon as I read that. I was like, oh, you're trying to build people up in Canada, bro. You mm-hmm. need all the help you can get. Wow. <laughs> you need all the good press you can get because up there, being in the press is not yeah. easy. Not easy at all. So, and he's an artist. I think we highlighted a lot of everything with him. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I also find it funny. Like Aleem got in that got in that one magazine. Perfect time. He got the with the right. He got with the journalist who's about to fucking quit. <laughs> Walking out of there. No, let me do one more. Yeah. Yeah. How's that for luck? Like, eh, all right, I'll do one more. Come on, kid. Let's go. <laughs> that's so fucking crazy. I mean, that's fantastic, you know. You know, there are good people like that out there, you know. Well, like I said, you know, uh, the indie community, you know, um, to me, you know, has always kind of seemed that way over the years of, you know, going to conventions, you know, they're just a little more, you know, hey, how's it going? You know, well, I tried this, and, you know, what do you do? And blah, 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 you know, they're. A little easier, you know, to, you know, work with. Well, yeah, um, I mean, but that's also where the artists connect to each other. Like, hey, man, why don't you do my, a cover for my for my comic? Why don't you do, uh, you know, a, why don't you do this for me? Why don't you do that? Why don't you write? Why don't you do this for this comic? Or why don't you do this side story? You know, there's that interconnectivity. Just like you're mm-hmm. talking about, like, reaching out to Josh and all this different kind of stuff of finding a way to include somebody that you've met in that con community to help right. boost them up, but also to, I don't need to personally do this. If I could get somebody else and boost them up to do this, ease mm-hmm. a little bit off of me so I could focus on this. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's that kind of spinning of multiple plates that you kind of have to do in it. Right. right. But it pays out because then it's this guy. And this guy, hey, he's also focused over here. And then it's like he was saying in that rant, hey, why am I always see this guy pop up? Oh, Mm -hmm. this guy has a podcast. You know, it's that kind of thing that there's this interconnectivity in all that we do. And, you know, we're not really shitty people. We're generally nice. Try to build people up as much as we can. As long as I'm not behind my car. And I'm generally, I try to be a nice person, but, and it's, there, the indie level is like a whole other level of nice. It's like Canada nice, to where you're like, <laughs> what? Well, I don't know about that, but, you know, they're, some, they're nicer, you know, but I don't know about it. Compared to some know? of the, some of the automotive shops I've worked at, <laughs> that checks out. That yeah. Checks out. <laughs>